What's the purpose of a demo? Let me know in the chat. What are we trying to accomplish during a demo? Why do we even do them? We know that buyers want them. And uh, if you're an SDR or work with SDRs, you know that we like to set demos. Let me know in the chat, what's the point of a demo? Carrie says it can be used for discovery. Absolutely. We're going to talk about that today. Yeah, Sean, helps client paint a picture of how you'll solve their challenges. For sure. Competence to solve the problem. The other Sean says, yeah, solution, add color to a process. Petra says, qualify the buyer. <laughs> Larry says, sell some product. Show that we can meet their needs. Yeah, taking away hesitation, Tanya says. That's a really good one. So reducing buyer uncertainty. Definitely. Jeshua has got a really good one in there too. Yeah, give enough context info for the buyers to make a decision. Okay, let's talk about this part first. Okay, so I'm going to have some stats and all that kind of stuff here for you. Um, I was like, I'm really big on data. And I think having a reason why that we demo is super important. And I always like to show this stat. It actually might be higher in a recent Gartner report, but 72% of all buyers, B2B buyers, desire a rep-free sales experience. Yeah, Sean, pretty crazy. Now, let's talk about the reason for that. This is the first key idea I want to share with you, is demo is not a stage. If we cannot explain to the prospect why we're giving a demo, we're not ready to do a full-on demo yet. The reason why this stat is so high is that prospects and buyers, especially when they start inviting other people, like we want them to, right? We want additional stakeholders there. We want them to invite people. What oftentimes happens is it ends up being a huge waste of their time. I've been guilty of it. I don't know. Let me in the chat if you've ever felt like a buyer was wasting their time on a call with you. Maybe it was earlier in your career. This still happens to me every now and then where, hey, we're talking about something and I feel like the, like the conversation hasn't been productive for the buyer. And the bottom line is that it's happened so much that people are like, you know what? I would like to self-serve as much as possible and talk to a sales rep when I need to get like pricing, (laughs) right? So demo is not a stage. We need to have a really good, compelling reason. Yeah, lots of good stuff in the chat. Yeah, Sean says, yes, crash and burn when I got a decision maker on the phone because coach and them weren't on the same page. So we're going to talk about that too. So these are bad reasons to demo. The prospect asked for a demo. Hey, it's the next step in our sales process, Jason. Like that's, that's what we're supposed to do next. Those are not compelling reasons for the buyer to use the demo as a way to do what I'm going to talk about next. Okay. Gartner talked about something else in their study that I thought was really interesting too. And they looked at modern buying environments, especially in the last six to 12 months with the current economic conditions. And they found that a lot of buyers fit into this category of what they call uncertain buyers. These were people that took much longer to make decisions. And what they found is that 30% of those buyers are less likely to complete a purchase at all. So they're less likely to even make a purchase and 42% less likely to complete a high quality deal. So when we think about the purpose of what we're trying to accomplish through a sales process, We're trying to do a couple of things here. So here's the second key idea before we get into the demo. The biggest misconception about demos is that the prospect is just going to see your solution and they're going to connect all the dots and see all the value. Our job is to make the connection. And someone mentioned this earlier. I don't know if it's Petra or someone in the chat. We want to use the demo as a way to reduce buyer uncertainty and risk right? Reduce buyer uncertainty and risk. One thing that's super important to know is buying is inherently more risky than selling. Let me know in the chat if you disagree with that. Buying something and making a poor buying uh, purchase, which happens over half the time, according to McKinsey, I think it's like 57 or 67% of change management initiatives fail. So buying something and messing that up is significantly more risky than selling something and it not working for the buyer. Usually in sales, we don't get fired 
our political capital is not at stake within the company if we sell something and the delivery team doesn't follow through, <laughs> right? As a buyer, if that happens, it's really, really bad. So it's inherently more risky to buy than to sell, okay? So next part of this, all right? So what we're going to dig into, especially at the enterprise level, Sean, absolutely. Uh, and by the way, if you, you guys are like the engagement's been great in the chat. If you have a specific question as we're doing this, make sure to use the Q&A button. I'm running the webinar by myself today. So it's uh, sometimes the stuff in the chat gets a little buried when I'm trying to multitask here. Uh, so here's what I'm going to give you today. Uh, one, we're going to talk about the demo framework. Uh, I'm going to give you an example demo based on how I demo our training platform. So when I'm selling, so I want you to actually see what good looks like. And you know what would be really fun too? If you have any critique for me today, on how I could have done something better, I would love for you to be honest and call me out in the chat. Okay, does that sound cool to everyone? And then we'll save a little bit of time for Q&A, all right? So let me know so I can customize the content. Let me know in the chat, at what point in the demo do you struggle most to engage the buyer? Let me know in the chat. Are there specific moments in the demo or throughout the demo that you feel are a challenge for you or where you really kind of struggle to engage the buyer or the group of people on the call? Let me know in the chat. Yeah, Alex, let me know when you say typically in the middle, what are you doing in the middle of the call? Let me know. Joy, that's a tough one. When there's a ton of people on the call, it can be really tough. Yeah. Yeah, Alex says after about five minutes of demoing or showing. Yeah, that's a tough one. Yeah, Tia. When a buyer joins without mentally preparing for the meeting, which I feel like is every meeting that I'm on with a buyer, <laughs> they, they, they rarely come in prepared. We have to like kind of do a reset at the beginning of the call. Yeah, trying to get them to talk more, losing the audience because you got too into the weeds and too often. Yeah, Dan says it's the constant check-ins because it's workflow intensive for sure. You guys, one of the reasons why I asked this stuff in the chat is hopefully it makes you feel a little bit better that other people are probably experiencing similar challenges when it comes to demoing. That's why I like to ask this stuff in the chat. Yeah, so Elizabeth says when their response is only always okay or yes or cool or I don't know about you guys. I noticed that as soon as I share my screen, I typically see the prospect looked over at their other screen like this and they can tell that they're responding to Slack or email. Like that's, that's like one of my big pet peeves. So let's talk about the framework and the steps that we're going to take. Yep. Happens to the best of us, Megan. <laughs> Let's talk about the framework and steps that we're going to take. And then, um, like I said, I'm going to give you like an actual demo today. And I'm going to demonstrate this framework in action. So let me share the iPad. And let me actually, here, I'm going to give you guys a little bit of a preview of what I'm going to give away to you at the end of this too. Here, let me, let me share my screen. Okay. So everything that I'm going to cover today, I'm going to drop it into this worksheet. So you guys are going to have like how to prep for demos. You're going to have the demo structure, which I'm going to talk about right now. You're going to have like a prep template, note-taking templates. I'm going to share all this shit with you afterwards. So that's kind of where we're going with this. So let's talk about the framework first, okay? So let me do this. Okay, so we're going to break up the demo into a few components, okay? So the part that happens before the demo we're going to talk about is the preparation. Let me know in the chat, what kind of preparation do you do for the demo? What are the key parts that you come into the demo having prepared to make sure that the demo goes well? Let me know in the chat, what are some of the big things that you bring in from a prep standpoint? Yeah, you definitely want to know the company well, for sure. Okay, John, you nailed it. So knowing what problem they're trying to solve. Alex, pain points, yes. Okay, so we definitely want to do, we want to know consequences of status quo. And we'll talk about how to get that. If, if you don't have it in this call, we'll talk about how to do additional discovery. But what we want to do coming into this is we want to know what is undesirable about their current state. If we don't know what's undesirable, we're not going to be able to make a really compelling case for why they should do different. Okay. And ideally, I know this for each person that's going to be on the call. 
Yeah, Dan says relevant case studies and examples. Absolutely. So I need to know consequences of status quo. The other thing that I need to know is outcomes of future state. So in other words, I need to know what's not desirable about right now and where are they trying to go and what are they trying to accomplish, okay? Everything that we do is going to be connected back to that. What I find is that there's oftentimes pieces of this puzzle missing where we haven't actually thought about what is the transformation that this prospect is trying to make, okay? We're going to talk about how to get that here in a second if you don't have it, okay? So the first thing I need to do is prep. I want to know every single person on the call, ideally, consequences of status quo, and what are the outcomes of the future state for them, okay? The next thing that we want to do, so when it comes time to actually running the demo, the big thing that we need to do at the very beginning is frame the conversation. So a lot of you in the chat had mentioned something around, well, how do I, uh, you know, I, I get a prospect that comes on the call and they don't seem mentally prepared. So our first goal at the very start of the conversation, we set a quick agenda. We want to frame what are the reasons why we were having a demo today. And oftentimes that's going to be going through what I call state of the union. Okay. So I'm going to flip back and forth and I'm going to show you guys some specific examples and we're going to go through this in stages. Okay. So here's what this looks like. This is the very first slide that I open up and share when I'm demoing. Okay, I'm gonna give you guys a second to take a look at this. What do you guys notice? This is prepared prior to doing the actual demo. What do you guys notice? What sticks out to you on my screen here? The challenges are in red, the colors. Okay, besides the colors, <laughs> besides the colors and the layout. <laughs> All good, Megan. What do you guys notice about the language that's on here? Okay, a lot of you are talking about numbers, metrics. It's all about them. Yes. Actual numbers. Okay. What I've been able to do through discovery is, and this is real, this is for an actual prospect, is I have said, hey, here's what I understand to be important to everyone. Imagine if I'm doing a demo and there's four or five people on the call and three of them are new and it's an executive. I can say, hey, based on my conversations with Katie and with John, my understanding is that your top two key priorities and objectives are maximizing our footprint within existing accounts and transitioning to more of a learning impact uh, platform, excuse me, that impacts the entire customer's org versus just focusing on their IT department. The current challenges I understand are that you want to drive net new meetings and the team's hitting about 57% of target. And the impact of that is that you guys are going to fall short of your re revenue targets within these key accounts without more meetings. The other thing is that when your team is running those meetings, the intro call conversion rates down. The team's at about 70% of target and deals are stalling out and taking way longer to close. And what I understand to be the desired future state is that you guys want to get to these numbers. So I walk them through that. Like the whole purpose of the demo is just to show you how we can help you get from here to here. Okay. Let me know in the chat, how do you feel like you could use something like this at the very beginning of your demo? What are you taking away? Let me know in the chat. I call it a state of the union. This is the very first thing that I want to cover in the first few minutes. How do you think that you could use something like that in your demos and in your calls? Yeah, Mel does a verbal version. I like it written too, Mel, just because um, people can see it and then you can add corrections to it live on the call. And I'll talk about that in a second. Yeah, Sean, ideally what I'm doing, Sean says, even if you're wrong, you verify with a client that they'll coach you uh, to course correct. I'm inviting them to correct me and add input. That's exactly what I want. Yeah, it's very focused. I'm going to verify. Uh, Brian, I got all of this info in a previous call, an intro call, where I did some discovery. So discovery, demo, that might be the same call for you, or excuse me, intro and demo might be on the first call for you, depending on what you're selling. Most of you, I'm assuming, probably separate those two calls. 
but I want to get this type of stuff prior to going into the demo. Yeah, so Lisa says it's difficult to get something like this with our prospects because many times they don't even understand the reasons for issues or where they want to go, except for better. So Lisa, does anyone, give me a yes in the chat. Does anyone here uh, relate with Lisa's challenge of, hey, you know what? Um, sometimes our prospects don't even know where they want to go. Yeah, give me a yes in the chat. Okay, so I'll give you guys a quick tip because a lot of discovery and demo, we tend to think of discovery as a call and discovery is really an action that's happening through the entire sales process, okay? So I'll give you tip number one is if the people that you were talking to or the prospect you're talking to doesn't know baseline metrics of what they want to accomplish, you might not be talking to the right person or you might use that as a reason to invite other people into the conversation, okay? Usually there is some sort of OKR and objective and some key results that every executive that that prospect rolls up to that they're trying to accomplish. So you can use that as a reason to multi-thread. So if you have a first initial conversation with someone, let's say they're at a manager, director level, and they're not quite sure like what they want to accomplish and what the actual initiative is, like use that as an opportunity to coach them. For me, it sounds something like this because I talk to sales managers sometimes and they don't know how their numbers are connected to the bigger initiatives. I might say, hey, well, I noticed that Brian uh, over there is your VP of sales, and it looks like uh, you have a director of sales, you know, Josh so-and-so. Um, do you think that they might have something to add on the conversation in terms of what they're trying to accomplish across the sales org? Yeah. How do you think they're thinking about it right now? Awesome. Well, you know, in our next call, why don't we invite them into the next call? You guys can have a chat beforehand, and we can make sure the things that you want actually align with the larger organization initiatives. Right, So I can invite other people to the call and I can use the lack of metrics as a reason to get other people involved, okay? The other thing that I can do too is if they're not quite sure where they wanna be, what the desired future state is, it could just be fixing the problems. I need to at least quantify the problem, okay? Yeah, Brian says, how do you, how do you invite other people? What exactly do you say? I gave you a talk track just now of exactly what I would say. So, uh, hey, typically when we're talking to folks like you, you guys need to know step number one. Let me write this in the chat. Who should be involved in the buying process? That's step number one. So you should already know before you even run a first call with a prospect, ideally, based on all of the other deals that you have either closed or that your people on your team have closed, who are the typical players that are involved? If you're selling something that's IT or security related, let's say, you know that I typically need to have folks on the security team involved. The CISO tends to be the economic buyer. And maybe there's like a VP of security that tends to be like my champion, my executive sponsor. So you need to know who are the people ideally that should get involved based on all of the other times that you've sold your solution. One of the things that I'll, I'll say before we kind of continue here is that you are an expert at helping customers get the right outcomes with your solution. They are not. You've walked many more customers through your solution and the buying process and all of that kind of stuff than your prospect has bought. Right? And it's also a good discovery question, AR says. Yep. Cool. We good? Keep moving. All right. So let's get back to the slide here. So I want to be able to show this at the very beginning of the call. Okay. Now let me backtrack a bit and I'll show you off this worksheet what I'm working off of right now and what I'll share with you. I like, by the way, note taking templates that are in bullet point form. I literally take this, the template that's right up here. I copy and paste this into a notes field in my CRM. I use HubSpot. So if you use HubSpot, Salesforce, whatever it is, I like to work directly where I'm going to be taking notes. So that's the order that you're seeing stuff in here. And let me zoom in. So prior to the call, I talked about prep. Hey, and I removed the names here just for privacy because it's uh, very specific information. I want to define for each person what's their status quo, what are the consequences, and what are the outcomes of future state. This is how specific that I want to get. So that's the prep that I do beforehand. And then I want to know, and again, I redacted the 
customer name? What's a customer story that I can share? And then what do I want the next step to be after this? So I'm doing that prep beforehand, okay? Now, what might happen as we're framing the conversation is we might find out that, let me flip back, that there's an opportunity for more discovery, okay? So when you say, hey, here's what I understand your focus is to be and why we're having the conversation today, um, one thing I forgot to ask, or if it's new people, hey, you know, Rod, really great seeing you on the call today. One of the things I was really curious about is when you guys say maximizing our footprint within existing accounts so that I can custom and tailor the demo for you today, is there a specific target that you're trying to hit? How will you know if you've done a good job of that or not? When you talk about transitioning to a learning platform that impacts your customer's entire org, um, usually that implies there's some sort of cross-selling or upselling target. Is there something specific that you guys are trying to accomplish that this platform would help with? Cool. So that's an opportunity to do additional discovery. All right. Um, everyone cool so far? We got any questions? Anyone stuck, lost, confused? I know we went on a bit of a tangent there around multi-threading, discovery. All of that's good. If you had a half hour demo, let's say, or 45 minute demo, if you spent the first five to 10 minutes doing that, that would be a really good productive use of time. Cool. All right. So let's get back to the framework. Okay. There we go. Okay. So at the very beginning of the call, I want to frame the reason for the demo. Okay. Where I'm going to be spending the bulk of my time and what I want to do, this, this middle part is called a resonance loop is what I call it. Okay. I want to pick probably two to three core features to focus the entire conversation around. Okay. And I'm going to run through a loop. So I'm going to pick a particular feature and I'm going to give you guys an example here in a second. Okay. I want to always connect everything I show. I want to connect back to why it's important that they see it. So that's the status quo, the priority, the outcome that they're trying to accomplish. I want to connect it back to my solution. And then I want to confirm resonance. So in other words, I want to confirm that they see the connection. So this is the questions that we're going to ask at each stage. So if I'm doing a 45-minute demonstration, let's say, I might spend five to 10 minutes in each of these parts. So as I pick the features, I'm going to go through, why are we talking about this? Then I'm going to share my screen. I'm going to connect it back to our solution. So what they care about, I'm going to connect it back to how we can help them. And then I'm going to confirm that they see resonance, okay? So let's talk about this part, this resonance loop. Here, let me share my screen again. All right, we're doing all kinds of back and forth today too. So hopefully no one's getting dizzy. Okay, so here's what we're gonna look at. So we got this first slide, right? State of the Union, once I confirm that this is good to go and I've done the additional discovery that I need to do, I'm gonna to start to transition over into what I'm about to show them, okay? So what I'm about to show you guys is uh, our training platform and specific tools that we use, okay? And just so you guys can see, the prep that I've done beforehand is the demo part. And again, this note-taking template I'm gonna give you guys, I already figured out that, hey, for additional discovery, I need to figure out these two things. I just framed the demo. So I had like written this out. And then I already picked out the areas that I was gonna plan on demoing, okay? So assessing the team's challenges through benchmarking, we're gonna talk about creating common language and a cold track, a cold call talk track, okay? I'm gonna move this over to my other screen. And what I will typically have on my second screen open is I will have like my notes, the direction that I'm taking, I'll have that open on the second screen so that I can quickly review it, okay? So the way that I'm gonna transition is I might do something like this. Um, hey, so it sounds like we have some good alignment here on, on like what we're talking about, why, et cetera. I picked out a few areas that I wanna show you that I think are really gonna make the biggest impact. Uh, one is benchmarking. We'll show you how we kind of benchmark, customize the program, help your team focus on the right stuff. And the second thing is creating common language around the things that your reps are saying in their cold calls. Okay. And that and we're going to talk about how that can drive the net new meetings that you're talking about. Cool. So I'm going to pick one of those first. Okay. I'm going to give you a good example of what not to do. Okay. 
At this stage, typically what people will do is start doing stuff like this. Uh, hey, so as you can see, here's our platform. Uh, once your reps get uh, access here, they're gonna have access to a bunch of courses. So let me show you the course. So there's something called Outbound Foundations. And basically what this is gonna walk you through is you know, how to build a game plan, how to focus your effort and choose a niche and craft killer messaging. And it'll talk about, you know, how to create cold call talk tracks and voicemails. And, and then it will like, is anyone like already getting bored and wanting to leave the webinar? <laughs> right. Um, we do not want to go through all of the features of our thing and go through step by step. We want to pick a couple of things that we connect right to. Okay. So if we did that over again, the way I might transition is something like this. Okay. Uh, so the first thing that I want to show you is you had mentioned that net new meeting uh, creation was down. The first thing that I want to show you is figuring out exactly what your team needs help with, with net new meeting creation. So oftentimes you had mentioned that call reluctance was an issue. Sequence is having low conversion rates. I'm going to show you how we specifically diagnose what's going on with your team and then how we can help you set more meetings. Okay. So when we log into the platform here, as you can see, there's a bunch of different stuff going on. I'm going to focus on something specific I think would really move the needle for you there. So in our content library, there's some really cool sales tools in here. And there's something called a sales math calculator. Okay, so one of the very first exercises that we do, and you can open this up, your team can open it up, is we actually take you through a benchmarking exercise. And what you're looking at here is all of the different conversion rates across the entire sales and outbound funnel. And what this specifically helps us do is figure out where is your team having challenges? So for example, oftentimes we find that the number of emails that people reply to and the conversion rate of replies to meetings booked is oftentimes a challenge. And we can figure out where do you lie here and what curriculum would we need to focus and train around to specifically diagnose what your team needs help with. And then we can use that to focus the training. And then I would stop sharing my screen here. And then I'd say, hey, so I'm really curious, how do you see your team using this benchmarking tool to figure out what to focus on most that will drive the net new meeting target that you guys are shooting for? So I wanna pause here. What are you guys taking away so far? And I said at the beginning too, feel free, there's, you guys can say what you like. You can critique what I just did. If you have a different way that you might have gone about doing that, let me know in the chat. What do we think? Sean says, are you pitching us for your services? <laughs> I, I think uh, for me, making it a really like practical, this is what I demo on a regular basis. Is my is the this the platform in the in the training? So um, yeah, content is tailored to their challenge. AR says. Yeah, so John says you're focusing on a specific thing you know will help them and control the narrative. Absolutely, Mark. Yeah, so Joshua said something that I was hoping some people would pick up too, is uh, the screen switching. So I don't want a prospect to see anything on my screen until I've given them context for what I'm about to show them. So absolutely, it's less distracting that way and I can control what they're seeing. The other thing too, I find that when you bring it back to the camera like this, prospects tend to pay attention more. Yeah. Yeah, taking screen share off adds engagement. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, I can see the body language, Sean says, all of that kind of stuff. So I'm picking a specific feature. I talked about why I'm going to show this. I connected it back to what we can help with. And then I also confirmed uh, what did you guys notice about the question that I asked? John, great question in the chat. If you could drop it into the q and I'll get to it. Yeah, what did you guys notice about the question that I asked? After I was done sharing it, the way the question was phrased, what did you guys pick up on that? Because that part's really important. Brian says open-ended. Yes. Okay. So I always like to ask open-ended questions that get them to think and kind of do a little bit of work. 
Yes, Sarah. Seems like you're trying to get them to sell themselves. Yeah. The, the, the best way to sell something to someone is to get them to confirm in their own mind why it makes sense and to justify it and for them to take the information that they're seeing and sell themselves. So an open-ended question could be as simple as, how do you see your team using this to fix XYZ problem? How do you see your team using this to accomplish XYZ outcome? Yeah, Mark says, based on what you said. Yeah, and you know what? If they don't have a good answer, that's a good talking point for you, okay? So let me share my screen again. Another technique that you can use here that I really like, it's very simple. We talked about the screen sharing technique is after I show this, I could say, hey, so one of the first things that we're going to do is just benchmark to make sure that your, uh, your team is working on the thing that they need right now. And they're getting just in time help, not just in case help. And that's how we can improve the outcomes of the training and how we can really have a good program that gets really great results. So I have a question for you because what we talked about first was that we need to move this net meeting target and we're hitting about 57% of it. So I'm really curious, based on what you've seen so far with benchmarking, how do you see your team stacking up from a benchmarking standpoint? And how do you see them using that to kind of customize the curriculum for the team? All right, so I'm gonna connect it back. And I can always flip back to that State of the Union slide if you need to, I like to do that. Okay, so let me pick another area to focus on. Let me know if you guys have any questions. Let me look at the Q&A real quick and see if there's anything. Okay, Dan asked a really good question in the Q&A. He says, uh, what can you do if your company tries to do discovery on the demo call, so therefore you don't have time to do a bespoke presentation? <laughs> so, um, okay, you can do this in a couple different ways. Dan, in the chat, can you let me know, like, what is the, like, ACV or average deal size or anything like that? Can you provide that for me in the chat? Because that's going to dictate my answer. What is the size of the typical engagement? So about 20, I don't know what that is in US dollars. I think it's either 10 US dollars or it's double that, one or the other, 10, 10K. Um, so if you sell something that's fairly transactional where you need to kind of like discovery and demo and do it in the very first call, what I'm trying to do in the first 10, 15 minutes is I'm trying to figure out what are they trying to accomplish and what's getting in the way. I need to have something tangible, a tangible problem or outcome. So a tangible problem that they're trying to fix or a tangible outcome. And I'm going to demo specific things I need to know in advance, which if you've been demoing your solution for a while, you should know in advance what will help with those things. And I'm going to give them a preview. So I'm going to say, hey, obviously, you know, we have 45 minutes today. I don't have time to show you everything. But what I would like to do is figure out a little bit more about what you're trying to accomplish. Uh, if there's any problems, any of that type of stuff getting in the way. And then that will help me customize and, and show that maybe the top two or three areas of our solution that could help you today. So let's dig in. So what is it that you're trying to accomplish? Why did you decide to uh, book the call with me today? Right? Or you could say, typically people like you, when I'm talking to sales executives, uh, it's one of two things that we're hearing right now. One is how do we get our account executives to do more self-sourcing? So maybe we've tried everything from giving them scripts and templates and you know having power hours, but we can't get them to self-source pipeline. Or two, what we oftentimes hear about is running tighter sales cycles. So you guys are having to multi-thread more because finance is getting involved. There's more stakeholders involved and it's increasing the length of the sales cycle. So how do we reduce that? How does that compare to what you're working on? All right, so we could do something like that. So hopefully that helps you, Dan. I want to get focused as quickly as possible around what the prospect is trying to accomplish what's getting in the way. And I want to let them know that we can't cover everything today, but I'm going to do my best to show you the things that I think you'll really care about. And that creates a good reason to hop on the next call. So Dan, let me know if that helps you out. Um, yeah, Gleb says, sometimes clients are looking for a magic pill. So they would like to have uh, way too many needs covered, which is just not possible to do with just one product. And it takes time for you to explain that it's great. We can just do this. One of those might do a few things, but not so well. How to speed up the process. Um, Gleb, this is a pretty kind of advanced question that you asked. So essentially what he's asking is, um, hey, what if we sell a product that doesn't do everything that the prospect wants, but it's better than competing solutions? Like I would let them know that as you're showing and going through the solution. Hey, one of the things I noticed 
uh, Gleb, is that it looks like you're you're hoping to accomplish a lot of things. You want sales training for your reps. You want sales engagement tools that they can use to actually send emails out, make phone calls, all of that kind of stuff. And then you're looking for a place to get contact information too. So I'll be the first to tell you, um, typically those are two or three different tools. The thing that I can really help focus on today and what where we can add a lot of value and where we've added a lot of value for similar types of customers is around the training and coaching component. So essentially, it's the stuff that they're doing the sales engagement with, the talk tracks they're using, the emails that they're going to send to the people that they would get the contact information from. So we can talk about how to drive a higher ROI from your tool spend. Cool. Yeah. Um, Gleb, hope that helps you. Yeah, no problem. Brian says, can you help me prioritize those things? Brian, I love what you said there too. So oftentimes when buyers are trying to accomplish a lot of different things, yeah, just acknowledge that. Hey, I, I love that you have a really good idea of what you're trying to accomplish. Where my head is kind of going is there's obviously a lot of things that you want to accomplish at all times. And there's a lot of problems. If you had to prioritize those and say, hey, here are the top two or one thing that we really care about doing. What is that thing? And you know what's actually really good too, uh, Brian, is uh, if you can do that in a group, you can gain what's called problem consensus. Just getting the entire stakeholder group aligned on the problem that they want to fix and trying to find a pattern in the similarity of the problem and getting them to agree on the problem, that's a really powerful thing to do before you demo. Now everyone's on the same page. Um, cool. All right. John asks, how often will you stop and restart screen sharing during a 45 minute demo? Um, dude, I might do that like a dozen times. <laughs> John, it depends on how many questions they ask. So if someone has a question and it's unrelated to what I'm showing on my screen, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. That's a good best practice. So is what they're seeing on the screen, just know that people can't listen and read at the same time. So is what I'm sharing on the screen going to enhance what we're talking about? Or is it not related? If it's not related and it's not going to enhance and stop sharing your screen. That's like a really, really, really simple thing that you could do. Um, okay. Let's, um, I want to give you guys the rest of the framework here. There's just a little bit I want to button up here. And then we can... Uh, we can get to more Q and A. You guys have a ton of great questions today, so I want to make sure to get to as many as we can. Okay, cool. So we've done this resonance loop. Okay, this is the uh, sort of keystone habit to. And then my Apple pen pencil's not working anymore. So <laughs> the uh, the resonance loop that is the key habit, right? That is the key skill during the demo to master. I need to always. Before I show my screen, explain why I'm about to show them what I'm showing them. I want to connect my solution back to the why. That's what they're trying to accomplish, the problem they have, et cetera. And then I want to confirm through the use of open-ended questions. The last part I would write in there, but my Apple pen is not working for some reason with the iPad, is I want to secure next steps. Always save five minutes at the end of the demo to secure your next steps. So that's the framework, okay, in a nutshell. Before I start to get some more questions and all of that kind of stuff in, um, let me know in the in the Q and A if you got a question related to what we've talked about, drop it into the Q and A. I'm going to try and get to as many of these as possible. But hopefully, what you've taken away from today, and let me share my screen one more time so that we can get you the resources, and I'll share the worksheet with you. We made really good time today. I don't I don't normally have this much time for Q and A. Okay, so. What I'm going to share with you here, let's drop it into the chat so that you guys have it. All right. When you click on that, it should force you to make a copy. I think the big takeaway for you guys today is whether you decide to use the visual note-taking template here and copy it. Like I said, I'm a big fan of just taking these bullet points and just dropping them straight into a notes field or comments field in your CRM. Whatever you decide to do, what I'm hoping your takeaway is today is, hey, I need to prep beforehand and know for each person that I have had a conversation with or that I can get to some intel on, what do they care about? I want to prepare a customer story in advance, and I want to know coming into this call, what's the ideal next step? 
And then for the actual demo, I want to plan beforehand what missing parts need more discovery. What am I going to show them? And I'm going to prep and rehearse and doing all of that kind of stuff. And then I want to really use that resonance loop. I want to be able to talk about why I'm about to show them what I'm going to show them. I want to make sure it's connected back to our solution. And then I want to confirm. And there's a couple really simple, easy questions that you can do there. Okay, so let's go through some questions here. So Joe says, are you going to send a video uh, with templates? So Joe, you should get an email here in a couple of days, like with the replay of this and the templates and stuff. But I would I would grab what I dropped into the chat there. Um, TSSA, Jason, do you use any tools to help capture those notes? Uh, I personally, I use Wingman to record calls, but I'm I'm one of those people. I like taking notes on the call. So I have a note taker and, and something that's recording, but I, I like to take really good notes on the call so I don't have to go back and listen to it. I think the best hack that you can do is whether it's an intro call, a demo call, a scoping call, whatever types of calls that you have, outline it in bullet point form so that it can be dropped into a comments field or notes field in your CRM and use the talk track, the bullet points, what you want to talk about, use that in the same place that you take notes. I think that is like the ultimate hack because then you can just like take notes in the in the um in the same format that you would use it for later or send an email out with. That way you're reducing double work. Um okay, so Sean Robinson says, how many meetings do you think it takes you to get all of that prep info on average? It depends on the size of the org. So Sean, if I'm selling to a company, which a lot of teams I'm selling to are like 20 to 30 reps, is probably like half of the teams. 20 to 30 reps, like account executives, that's going to have like, you know, three or four sales managers and like a director of sales probably, and then a VP of sales. In one meeting, usually that takes 30 to 45 minutes, I can get most of the information I need to do a really good demonstration. Now, I also work with companies that have like two, three, 400, 500 plus reps. That's a little tougher. So oftentimes I'm like meeting with one person, I'm doing a short demo just with them to get them bought in to like looping the rest of the buying committee in. So it depends on what you're selling. I think instead of focusing on how many meetings it takes, I would focus on like what you need to get. I need to know, like, am I talking to the right people? Which we talked a little bit about multi-threading today, but we have a whole, we, we have a whole course uh, a whole masterclass, excuse me, in our inner coursework on multi-threading. But the TLDR is like, I need to know who the proper stakeholders are and get that multi-threading conversation started. And once I know who kind of the key players are, have we gained consensus on what the problem is that they're trying to solve? Like, I really want to get that part before I do like a really, you know, get a bunch of people involved to hop on a demo. Um, so Sean, hopefully that helps you, buddy. Um, John says, how often will you start and stop? Yeah, we already answered that, John. All right, Brian, you're asking about those benchmarks. So I don't, it, this kind of depends on what you guys are selling, but I love to, one of the things that I'll do in a demo. So if, if your solution drives a very specific outcome, something that can be measured, I like to provide uh, benchmarks to people. So these benchmarks are taken from personal experience working with sales teams. And it's also pulled from like bridge group, sales loft, all that kind of stuff. And this is part of the educating that I'm doing during the demo. I can't remember who, uh, maybe it was Kyle Assay from uh, MongoDB. I think I'm mispronouncing his last name. I, I would go follow him on LinkedIn if I was you guys. Um, I think he put up a post yesterday on this. Like think about the ways that you educate prospects during your demos. So one of the things that I will do is like, I'll pull this up and be like, hey, with some of these specific areas you had mentioned around, you know, cold calling. One of the things that we look at is, you know, what are the number of like cold call live connects to meeting booked ratio? Like, where do you fall here? And they'd be like, it's, it's red. Honestly, it's less than 10%. I'm like, cool. So we have some work to do, right? So the way that we would prioritize building a training curriculum for you in this area is by doing X, Y, Z, right? So if you have benchmarks and things like that, that's kind of cool. Um, if you have a way to grade what they're currently doing, so like when I'm working with enablement people, I say, hey, the way that we approach training is really it's content delivery and reinforcement. What's the quality of the content that you're sharing with people? 
in your reps? Uh, what's the delivery method? So is it easily digestible? Are people putting it into action? And is there a reinforcement practice? Do your sales leader, leaders reinforce? And then I'll have them grade on the call. I'll have them grade themselves. And this exposes gaps too. So if you have a way to get the prospect to grade what they're currently doing, that's a really good way to like add a ton of value. Um, cool. Brian, hopefully that helps you out. Uh, Mike. Yeah, Mike asks, are you standing? The eye contact is really impactful and for this makes a better impression. Yeah, absolutely. I like to stand during this stuff, but it depends. For me, it's more about the size of the audience that I'm speaking to. <laughs> so there's, uh, I think, a couple hundred people here. I, I, I can't see you, obviously, but if I'm speaking to a group of people, my energy level needs to be a little higher. And it's usually for me, my energy level is better if I'm standing up. If I'm doing a call with one other person, I'm not usually standing. But looking at the camera like I am right now, like making eye contact, you don't need to be like really focused in on it the entire time, like a like a weirdo or a creep. But, uh, you know, occasional eye contact with the camera is great. It'll make people feel like they're looking at you and connecting. So, Mike, yep. All right, Dave Morton, what's going on, Dave? How do you approach discovery when the prospect has taken the meeting from outbound activity and may not have a defined need or challenge? The most likely have a need, but is dormant. Okay. So Dave, this is more of a discovery type of question. Um, so same thing kind of applies here. So the first thing that I want to do with discovery is I want to figure out, like, I want to put this prospect, I want to see if they fit a common situation that other customers we work with are in right now. So you can do that in a lot of ways, but if you think about what are the common priorities and problems that your customers have, I want to see if they fit it in any of those buckets. So you could say something like this. Hey, Dave, before we dig in, I, I know that I sent you a random email. Um, one of the things I thought that would be good is to just quickly kind of share like the types of situations and things that our current customers have going on that make them want to explore um, our solution a little bit more. Are you, are you cool if I share some of those things? And you're like, hey, typically when I'm speaking with a sales executive, they find themselves in a couple situations or they're trying to produce a few of these types of results. And then I share those, which I already gave an example of earlier. So Dave, I would, I would do that first in the discovery conversation. And like one of the things that you could do is like, you know, the benchmarking thing that I said just now is, is a way that you could do it. But if I was talking about AE self-sourcing, I might say, um, hey, so one of the reasons why you want to take the call was to get your account executives to do more self-sourcing. Typical benchmark that I'm seeing across other teams right now is around 30 to 40% of pipeline needing to be self-sourced by the account executive. How does that compare to what you're thinking about right now? What's the team doing right now for you, right? So that's how I approach discovery from an outbound standpoint is I really want to give a lot of context into why I'm asking the questions and I want to make sure that I'm educating the prospect. So a lot of sales leaders that, that, that talk to me, they want to kind of know how to benchmark success for account executives who may not have had to do a lot of outbound in the past, okay? So that's one thing that you can do. Um, Let's look here. Yeah, Rodrigo says it's hard because our leads are on the food industry. So they usually schedule the demos on the phone because there is a time constraint. Yeah. So we might be able to get to the, that. A little. Uh, if you guys, uh, I, we got five, 10 more minutes. So if you guys got more questions, keep dropping them into the Q&A. Um, Mark Knight says, I see a lot of AEs get discouraged when the prospect's timeline is 90 days out, but they're a fit for the product. Do you qualify the meeting for the SDR? The timeline is far out. How would you handle the situation? So I look at timing. Um, you can't like manufacture urgency out of nowhere, but timeline is something that if a prospect doesn't understand the consequences of status quo and what it's really costing them, you can use that to create uh, like a, or reduce, excuse me. You could use that to reduce the timeline. So I think that, if I'm an account executive and I get a call set up for me from an SDR and they say their timing is 90 days out, I'm like challenge accepted. Okay. Like I want to know like why the timing is what it is. And I want to figure out what are they trying to accomplish? What problem is getting in the way? And to give you a really practical example, like think about what does it cost to not change? So for me, it's meeting set, sales closed. For some of their clients, it's like reducing costs of their contact center because they're overspending. 
It could be if someone's selling security, which I was working with a client yesterday on, um, it could be like, uh, hey, we have this process right now where we detect threats really late and our developers have to spend a lot of time doing stuff uh, because the platform's not easy and it takes them away from working on the product. It's like, those are things that you can help the prospect quantify, right? So I think when a prospect says my timeline is 90 days out, I would think about if I'm coming in as a trusted advisor, like I need the prospect to know what the consequences are of waiting too long. And you know what? I also need the prospect to know if they even need to change at all, right? That's also a good thing to address. Uh, So Mark, hopefully that helps you. Yeah, you also asked, is it the AE's job to chase down budget and timeline? Absolutely. It's the AE's job. I'm not a huge fan of BANT. Um, And it's not because I'm not a fan of BANT. I'm actually not a fan of how it's executed. So any qualification framework like BANT, Medic, MedPick, whatever you want to do, if you're using it as a way to qualify whether or not a prospect is a good fit for a meeting, I'm just like... Really? Like you're going to have the SDR talk about budget and timeline in the first, in the cold call or a 15 minute call call. I don't want to do that at all. I want to figure out like what's going on right now and what's the current state. Is there a consequence to status quo? Does the prospect agree with that? Is there other people that do? Is there a future state that they're trying to accomplish? That's going to influence budget and timeline. That could create budget. That could extend or reduce the timeline. So I think that a qualified meeting is, is this at a named account that we care about? And is this a person of decent influence? So you have to define what that is at your org. But like for me, if I had an SDR setting up meetings, I wouldn't want to do a sales call with an account executive if I'm selling company programs, right? I would want to at least meet with someone that's, you know, got leadership influence in the org for that to be a qualified meeting, at least a manager or a director, Right. So whatever that is for your org, I would think about, is this at an account that we want to do business with, regardless of timing or budget? And are we speaking with someone that we deem qualified from an influence perspective, at least based on their role that we can figure out later? Um, Cool. Uh, Veronica, what do I do if a prospect was interested throughout discovery and demo and then stops engaging afterwards? Um, There's a couple of things that you can do. So hopefully, Veronica, what you did a good job of is we got what they're trying to accomplish and what the consequences of status quo are. That's what I'm going to do to re-engage them. So I might send an email that says something like, hey, Veronica, last time we talked, you mentioned that your team was losing out on about $5.4 million of pipeline each quarter because they were falling short about 15% of their net new meeting target. Did you guys get that all figured out? Or is this still something that we should revisit, right? So just keep in mind when people kind of ghost, it's usually because they've either figured something out or they just don't see value in continuing the conversation with you. And usually that's because you aren't talking about something that's like really big, that's a priority that they care about. And the key there, Veronica, too, would be to make sure that that doesn't happen. Always set a next step at the end of every call. Um, Cool. We got time for probably two or three more. Yep, you bet, Veronica. Uh, If demo is on a SaaS product, would you still stop the screen sharing and keep it on the show? How easy, seamless the flow is between different aspects of the software? Absolutely, Greg. Um, There's something called, um, what is it? It's not content fatigue, format fatigue. So I learned this. I've consumed a lot of materials on how to run good workshops and training calls and all that kind of stuff, because that's that's what I get paid to do, right? Um, One of the things they talk about is format fatigue. So if I just sat in front of you guys like this, didn't share my screen, didn't do any of that kind of, didn't ask you to engage, and I just talked at you for an hour, I know some of you like my content and stuff like that, but you probably wouldn't hang on very long if all I did was like monologue to you for an hour. So there's the reason why I break up stuff into like two or three sections. I focus for five minutes on something. I prompt you to, you know, share with me in the chat what you think about it. I, I, I work off the iPad. I share my screen. I do a lot of different stuff to try to keep your attention. So same thing, Greg, with a SaaS product, no matter what you're demoing, like mine is like part like platform and then part training and coaching. If yours is completely SaaS, I still want to like every five to 10 minutes, I want to stop sharing the screen and like make sure we're having discussion around stuff. I don't want to monologue for more than three, four, five minutes tops at a time. 
And it doesn't matter how good what you're showing is, it's format fatigue. I need to mix up the format that I'm using. I'm going to engage you like this. I'm going to show you stuff. I'm going to write down stuff. We're going to go back to a slide and maybe work out, workshop some stuff together. Like I want to change the format up to keep them engaged, Greg. Let me know if that helps you, man. Yeah, you bet. Man, wow. Our company has sales engineers that primarily run the demo. We as A's normally only have five, maybe 10 minutes to set agenda, recap, et cetera. How do you recommend we adapt your framework in a case like this? It's going to be really about prep. Um, this is a tough spot because nothing against sales engineers, but most of them aren't thinking about how do I, how do I create deal momentum? How do I move the deal forward through this demo? A lot of sales engineers are thinking about how do I demonstrate the tool really well? So there's kind of a conflict between what you want as a, an account executive and then what a sales engineer wants. So my best advice would be meet with the SC beforehand and get on the same page with what they're going to show and have them allow you to chime in and provide commentary so that you can work off each other. So I would do this prep work together with them. Okay. You could show them. Hey, based like here's the prospects, like current state, what they're trying to accomplish, where they're running into problems. Here's some of the areas they thought would be kind of good to share. What do you think? Okay, cool. You're going to focus on those five areas. Can we throughout, and I'm happy to chime in, can we make sure to connect those back to their priorities and the outcomes? The other thing, Manuel, that I noticed too with, and again, it's it sounds like I'm ragging on SEs right now. I'm not because we need SEs, especially if we sell something very technical. What you want to make sure to do, I think another common thing I see is that the SE will share something that the prospect doesn't care about. So let's say someone's coming to me to get help with cold calling. That's the big thing they care about and their sequences are great. If I just start talking to them about how we can help them produce better sequences and do all this other kind of shit, they're going to be like, the prospect's going to be like zoning out during that portion of the call. Okay. So I would align on what they're going to show and provide some feedback and suggestions around, hey, I noticed that you're going to show this. Can we not do that? Because the prospect, like they haven't shared any interest in any of that. All right. So there you go, Manuel. Hopefully that helps you. Um, okay. Shane asked, do you end a demo with next steps? If so, what would you do if you didn't know what the next steps should be? Shane, yes, you're always going to end with next steps. And this is the, uh, this is the, the last... <laughs> Manuel says, thanks, J-Baby. LOL, I meant to say J-Bay. It's all good, Manuel. <laughs> um, by the way, uh, before we take off, uh, like, thanks everyone for just the engagement today. This was super awesome. Uh, make sure to check out, let me drop it in. Uh, make sure to check out our website. We got a couple of really like interesting. There you go. Um, resources page. There's podcasts, there's free stuff there. There's um, like starter packs for the podcast that you can check out, especially if it's really good. And we have some programs for individuals too. So one is like 99 bucks a month for like access to all of our like courses and live master classes. We got another one if you're looking for private coaching. So make sure to check that out if you're interested. Um, but Shane, short answer to your question is always end the demo with next steps. And if you don't know what the next step should be, I would, in your prep, think about what would a next step look like? Like, what is this deal missing? And usually a deal is missing involvement from more stakeholders. So like an economic buyer or like a true champion, uh, the deal might be missing like, hey, this is not connected to a larger business initiative. We haven't quantified what we're trying to accomplish in this project, or we haven't quantified a problem. Like, think about the big things that the deal is missing in order for it to be a closable deal. That's what the next step is going to be for. Um, so Shane, hopefully that helps you. That's all I got for you today. Thank you everyone for showing up, participating. This was a lot of fun and we kind of went back and forth and freestyled it a bit today. So thank you everyone. We'll see you. Have a good rest of your day.